I just wanted to introduce um interview people like yourself because not only you've kept um you know you're doing a, a really traditional craft but you've actually got a really amazing heritage and you don't yes. come by that anymore so no that's true yeah <laughs> so it goes back to great grandfather 1884 and that was coincided with the revival in stained glass because it had been sort of in the doldrums i mean the heyday for stained glass was in medieval times so you're looking at the 14th 15th century um, it's a Christian art, so it didn't really get going until the uh, 12th century. That was the, they were the first cathedrals built and the first windows. So they've always kept that association with religion. So what you're saying in effect is that stained glass actually, the leaded stained glass came about because people were making windows to go into churches. That's is right. that where Is that where it yeah, originated? That's from? where it originated. So you're looking at... The 12th century were the earliest ones, and it started in Germany, although glass production had been throughout um, Egypt, Syria, uh, the Roman world, and it sort of edged its way. When it uh, came into the Roman Empire, of course, it spread. So it spread over to France and Germany, and that's where the first Gothic cathedrals were built. So, yeah. So you think of um, the cathedrals, like at Ely, Canterbury, um, Chartres in France. Um, Augsburg Cathedral was about the first in Germany. Mm. And of course, because they were built to glorify God, they went high, they built high with high yeah, spires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so huge windows. And if you think that the size of a piece of glass that they could produce was like that, that was the size. Mm. So they knew that they could produce glass but they didn't realise, or they didn't think, they had to think very carefully how to fit pieces of glass together. Mm. So of course lead, uh, they've been using lead since Roman times. But well, they're using that, they, they develop, yeah, for the sewage system. Yeah. yeah. So lead was very familiar to them, and also the fact that you can bend it easily, mm. and it's weatherproof. Mm. So what they did was to take their pieces of glass, which couldn't have been much bigger than that, and then cut them up into smaller pieces mm. and hold those smaller pieces together with lead. Okay. So the, we, when we're making a stained glass window, we're building it up like a jigsaw puzzle. Mm. So we start with our sheets of glass and our design. I mean, they used to paint on a table, the design. Of course, we use paper and paint. Well, what, how did that work? Well, they'd, they'd draw the design, the black lines where the legs were going to go, they'd paint them on the table. Okay. So when it came to cutting out the glass, they'd work on the table to cut the pieces out. Well, like on a wooden table? Yeah. Would they mm. use chalk or something? No, they'd, they'd have to wash it whitewash. Time, would yeah. They? Well, once you've made a window, you've finished with it. So you never make it again, really. But if they drew on the table, then mm. they'd have to wash the table off for the next... The next, yeah. So they use something like that. Yes. Like... Or they'd keep a tabletop if they wanted to make it again. Oh my God. But when you're making a window, if you're thinking yeah. of the Gothic windows, they're huge. Yeah, yeah. And you can't make them in one piece. You, the, when you're making a stained glass window, you've got to lead it together. So you put the pieces of glass, you mould the lead round. Then you put the next piece of glass in the groove mm. in the lead. So you've got like an H section. Yeah. and you're slotting the next piece in and then you're building it up and when you finish that panel you've not fixed anything together at this stage it's all loose so you couldn't turn it over it'd all fall apart right. um, so you've got to solder the joints and uh, then once you've soldered one side of that window you've got to be able to turn it over yeah. to solder the other side and it bends as and well. it bends yeah, yeah. and if you wanted to fill a great big window it would be impossible mm. because uh, the person who's got to turn it over it's the man who's glazing the window so it's the the panels as big as his, his arms the span of his arms oh right so he could manage it so he could manage to slide it off the table <laughs> turn it over put it back on and solder the joints oh, on the other my side gosh. So, of course, then they had panels that were all about that size and it st they still wouldn't fill the window. Mm. So they had to think of a way to join them all together. And the way that they'd done it, 
They did it then and they've done it ever since because nothing's changed. Same way, yeah. Same way. Was to solder pieces of copper wire on the top of the lower panel and the bottom of the next panel. So you've got... Uh, Is it like foil? No, no, it's wire. So okay. it's lengths of wire. So they sold the, sold them onto the joints. And then you put saddle bars into the stonework. So you've got your stone frame, if you like, yeah. your mullions. And they've got a groove in. And you slot the panel in. And then you centre it. And then you put a saddle bar across, which is just a round metal bar. Mm. And then you slot the next panel. And then you tie these ties around the bar. And that holds the window in place. So you can go as high as you want. Okay, yeah. So they can then they can slot into the H groove. Yeah. Is that, is that what you call it? Well, it's an H section, an H section. The, the leg. But you overlap the panels so that they, because cost weatherproofing is very important. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you've got to have the lead overlapping the top of the bottom panel. And so they build them up. So you can go as high as you want. So they're not actually flush, they're not flat then? They are flat. They are? Yeah. Okay. I've got a picture somewhere of one. But um, uh, you can go as high as you want and as wide as you want, as long as you've got these saddle bars at intervals to hold the panels. And they're rather like sails on a ship, they're hanging in the, um, in the windows. So they're quite suspended. I mm. suppose that stops them from bending as well, doesn't it? Because yeah, it supports them. Yeah, 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 the lead's very soft, so it starts yeah. to sag. And uh, windows have got to be taken out every 200 years anyway to re-lead them. Okay, why yeah. does it perish? Or? Well, what happens is that the joints that you've soldered uh, with the weather and this wind buffeting them and so on, um, they crack and uh, they start to lose, you've lost your rigidity on the window so it's, and they start to blow out. Okay, I've seen, that. seen yeah, that. I've seen yeah. it. So um, then the cement drops out of the grooves at the leg because you've got to cement. The very last thing is to cement to weatherproof. Yeah. And so over the years, all these deteriorate and then the water comes in and they bend more and more. And they're in danger of falling out. Yeah. So Which would be got tragic, to, wouldn't yeah, it? Because would. they're just so beautiful, you don't want that. So every 200 years at the most, probably less in some cases, you've got to take the panels out, each mm. panel, take a rubbing of it, strip it down, throw the lead away. Well, as I say, throw, you recycle the lead. Um, and then build up the panel again, as you did originally, with new lead. Mm. And then cement it to weatherproof it, fit it back in the window. And so it goes on every 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, carry on, sir. So they've just done the Great East window at York Minster. Right, so they take massive. all the panels out, it's the size of a tennis Did you court. go see him doing it? Yeah, then? well we did, yes, because we climbed up, um, when they had the scaffold up, we climbed up to see them repairing the stonework. Then we went to Glazy's workshop to watch them doing it, uh, rest, restoring it. So we stripped them down, cleaned the glass, because the glass doesn't alter. The only thing that happens to the glass is you get weathering over the years, you get a patina on top of it, so they, they were using cotton buds and distilled water to clean each piece of water. <laughs> is that what you were saying when they rub it down? Is that what you meant? No, they no, 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 exactly. this was just cleaning old glass really. You've got to be so careful with it. Because some of it's very thin, it's all made by hand, you see. Yeah, yeah. Some of it is really thin, so you're looking like a millimetre in thickness. Whereas then you'll get the next piece, it's like six millimetre in thickness. It varies because it's handmade glass. And uh, so they were cleaning each piece of glass with a cotton bud. <laughs> and somebody said to me, would you like a job here? I thought, no way. Oh, how boring, cleaning a piece of glass with this. Quite relaxing though. No, no. No. <laughs> so that's what they did, cleaned the glass and then re leaded it to the original design. Mm. And any bits that were broken, um, they restored those pieces. Mm. And then that puts it, it's absolutely fabulous now. So they used to restore, you know, after, if you think they'd take it out every so often to re mm. They weren't very fussy in the old days about how they did it. And there was one part of the east window, I think, that had um, somebody wearing a cloak and it was um, an amber colour. And in the middle of this cloak was the head of a donkey, or part of this head of okay. a donkey. 
And the Jew just used any piece of glass to <laughs> fill that gap. <laughs> it just got a random yeah. funky head just because... <laughs> Hello, how are you two? Right, so this is the first primitive um, vlog with um, Val and Emma from the Stained Glass Centre uh, near Scarborough. Um, so would you like to just introduce yourself, Emma, or I'll say something? Because, you know, just so... Are you... You're related, aren't you, to her? What's the relationship? Yes. Well, I know, but... I'm Emma. I'm related to Val in that she's my mother-in-law. Oh, it's all dreaded mother-in-law. <laughs> it's all her fault, so she's going to be addicted to glass. <laughs> Um, I can do, Val taught me to do stained glass, but really my passion is warm glass. So anything from 500 degrees up to 1200 degrees is kind of where I work. And that's where my I'm is. working in lower temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> so the original use of glass, when, where did it originate from glass originally? Apart from a lightning strike on some desert sand. I mean, where, where uh, you yes. know, that's yeah. the kind of what It you occurs mean. naturally in, vol in volcanic lava. Oh. So you, you've got to have a high temperature. Uh, so then I think it came from pottery and the glazes that they put on pottery. Oh, right. Okay. And it was in Egypt. So, you know, they were um, making pottery there. Uh, and the, it's like all things, they develop, don't they? They've mm. discovered a glob of glass at the bottom of the kiln, decided that would, could be quite useful in their windows. So the glass fusion is the older stuff, the hotter temperature stuff, which is what you're interested in. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I well, think that's like the the most proof, certainly that they used glass fusion in Egypt way back then, and that's probably stems from what like you're saying, found a blob of glass. Yeah, I mean the first, the film, they made glass for years and years, until they invented the blowing iron, they could only make uh, moulded glass, so it's like for goblets and mm. boxes, jewellery. So it's smaller bits of glass, they, and they could only cast a certain size. So you, you weren't even looking at the size of a panel of glass that they, they made church windows out of. And it was really thick and it had like, I've seen old glass, it's like got bubbles in yeah. it, and it's, it's really mm. beautiful. That's right. But um, once they invented the blowing iron, they could blow glass like a balloon, mm. and then split it to make a sheet. So that's when you started using it for glazing. Okay, so I'm trying to get my head round how a bubble of glass goes from blowing down a tube into a bubble to a flat sheet. Yeah, how well, it's like a balloon, really. It's okay. a long Yeah, you take right. a, a gather out of the furnace. So you're looking at 1500 degrees centigrade. Okay. So that's just silica, potash, and limestone, and uh, a little pot of a metal oxide to give the colour, because you don't want clear glass in church windows, really. Mm. So uh, different metal oxides give different colours to the glass. And then they would take a gather of glass on the end of a long blowing iron, so you're looking at quite a length. And then the glass blow, it still does it today. I mean, you can see glass blowers mm. working. Where well, they turn it all the yeah, time as they well. They turn it all the time and they mm. swing it from side to side and they blow. Why do they swing it? Is that just to... It's to help sort of... to get it stretching, if you like. Because you want a big long bubble. Yes, a big, long you're wanting a cylindrical see. bubble, as big as you can get. You don't want a round one. Do you to do this then? No, we don't. No, we don't have a furnace here. We'd um, like to, wouldn't we? But we'd, we'd I'd like to it. come and watch you do it. <laughs> right, you a... buy the furnace and we'll do it. Oh, all right. <laughs> I've, done, I've done a little bit of it. Um, and I honestly believed I would love it. It would change my life. It would be the best thing I've ever done. And I didn't enjoy it. I was surprised. <laughs> I thought I would. And I think it's because I was a lamp worker first, so I was working in, directly in a tiny little flame. I liked the idea of getting so much detail in something so small. But then there were the giant big furnace ones. and the big thing, blowing big stuff, and I, I didn't get as excited as I hoped I would, actually. Mm. Was, it surprised me. You see, they don't make glass for window glass in this country anymore. Since they stopped making it in Sunderland, yeah. um, Harpley Woods Factory was the last factory producing it. And they closed, I think it was 1998. So all the glass that we use for windows is imported. Where from? Uh, France and Germany. Okay. Because they're, they're the yeah, two main yeah, ones, because that's yeah. where it started. And they've always made this pot metal glass, we call it, or antique glass it's called. Really uh, called that because of the way it's made. It's not changed. Um, and then you get it from Poland, mm -hmm. Russia, China. Argentina, mm. America, 
American glass is more the opalescent glass, which you know has solid colour. Well, most of ours comes from Mexico now. Yeah. In fact, I would say ninety-five percent of it comes from Mexico. The stuff we're using mm. in the showroom at the moment, because the company that we're in America um, closed down, and then a company in Mexico bought it and so it transported the whole lot. Mm. Yeah. And so we've been slowly but surely getting more and more glass back in as they've learned to make it. Mm. I think I like little odd places in the country that make glass because, like, I'm thinking of like I'm, I live in Bristol. It's Bristol blue glass. Oh. I mean, do they they make their own glass? It's always been a good um, centre for glass making is Bristol. But they make their own to use it for their own purposes. Don't yes, they? and they're still making vases and things like that. Whereas sheet glass for windows is a little bit harder. Oh, so yeah. it's still <coughs> silica, but the um, the proportions of potash and limestone vary to make a harder glass. So glass makers in this country are making wine glasses, mm. a few goblet, bottles, yeah, all things that like that. Bottles. Not sheet glass because Not sheet glass, once like you've got your it. cylinder of mm. glass, your big balloon, if you like, you've got to chop that off at the top and the bottom, mm. and then you've got a cylinder, and they call that muff, a muff glass, and then you, you score it with a glass cutter mm. to cut, open it up, and then it's heated again, very gently and flattened out. So it's flattened out into a sheet. Oh, wait, it's and that's like, what you work with. Do you know, it reminds me of when you make rock. Yeah, <laughs> it's you quite know, similar. I know, similar, I know, I know it's like a different thing, but it, it's like, it's like toffee or, you know, yeah. that temperature, I suppose. It's like really malleable, isn't it? Yeah, mm. until you get it cool. Mm. Got but to it's not quickly. so malleable. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I suppose it does, It like, as soon as it sets, that's it. You can, you can reheat it, though, to... I now any creases or does it? Yes, you can. Do can do so. You can do. I think um, what people don't realise is once it's heated and it starts to cool down, you can't just use it as a sheet of glass. It's got to be annealed. Anneal, so you have yeah. to go back into a big kiln and then slowly anneal, which kind of takes all the stress out of the glass before you can use it. Without that, if you try mm. to cut it, it would go just be a nightmare. Yeah. It would just wander off wherever you try to cut it. it needs okay, so does it like stress in it? Okay, I think mm. I kind of get what you mean because you can see glass sometimes where it's like got little ridges, little ridges or ripples in it. Mm. They're the nice things. Yeah, oh, they're, yeah. they're actually encouraged <laughs> because they refract the light. Okay. And that's what you want. Yeah, yeah mm. the stresses that annealing takes out, you can't see with the naked eye. You could hold two polarizing filters either side up against the light and you'd see sort of white lightning running through it. It does look like white lightning and that's the stress. You need to take that out. So you kind of hold it at 482 degrees for usually an hour for certain thicknesses, usually probably for a sheet of glass I would say an hour is enough. And then that, once you then, if you did that and then slowly cooled it to room temperature and looked again through your filters, there'd be no lightning, all the stress would be out of it. So then you could cut it. What exactly would that lightning be then? Is it where it's heated at different temperatures and sort of stuck together and it's like a fault line or something. Or how, why is it bubbles? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it does. It's, it's sort of, um, it's stress lines within the glass. Think about it. It's been through hell and back already and you've superheated <laughs> it and then you've blown it to a bubble and you've rolled it flat. So it's gone yeah. through all that and it's all kind of moving And because of there. the different thicknesses, it, yeah, it, it cools at this. different times. You so think. that's... So you, yeah, yeah, some sheets of glass, remember they, some Hartley woods would be this thick oh, at yeah. one end and that thin at the other. Mm. So this would still be hot while that was cold, so you want it all to evenly be the same temperature mm. and then... So that's it's even temperature. temperature. Isn't it? mm. Mm. So your dad taught mm. you yeah. glass work. And his dad taught him, and his dad taught him. That's right. Do you want yes. to tell us a bit about, la- is it the Lazenby? It is. So William Lazenby. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Oh, really, he, I really uh, am interested. You know? Yeah, he uh, started the Bradford Stained Glass Work. So that was uh, 1884. He'd trained in Birmingham. Ooh. So he had trained under, because it was when the revival in stained glass, because nobody wanted it until William Morris and the Pre-Raphaelites. and. Yeah. Gothic church is being rebuilt. Um, so that's when he started because there was obviously a surge of interest. And it was the first time really that it had been used in houses, you know, ordinary houses, none street. Well, you know, it had been quite a wealthy street because it was still <laughs> expensive. Uh, so that was when he opened his stained glass works in Bradford. So, and um, 
he had uh, quite a workforce and he did a lot of church windows and also domestic stained glass. So then he had two sons, well, more, but two had been killed in the war. But two of his sons went into business with him. So that was my grandfather, mm -hmm. William, and great uncle George. Now, great uncle George was in charge and grandfather went off to the First World War. So when he came back, he decided that he would move to Scarborough. And the reason why, there was a building boom on the coast after the war, mm -hmm. and they were building lots of houses all along this coastline. And uh, he saw the potential. Yeah, because they've all got yeah. very lovely windows on the old window. Yeah. Front, <laughs> some lights, going so along there, front that's doors what, and yeah. things. So that's <laughs> when he came to Scarborough and started his business. Mm. Uh, and then two of his three sons went into business with him. So that was my father, Alan, and my uncle Jack. And uh, so it went on, but none of them had sons, and they thought, we need a son to carry on the business. <laughs> Never thought of a girl doing it. Not, not entered their heads, and I didn't anyway. I went up to teach, I was doing something different. And stained glass, because I was sort of a teenager in the 60s, stained glass was so old-fashioned. <laughs> no way did I want. And it was actually um, going out of fashion rapidly. People were taking it out of their window oh, and putting lovely double glazing. Oh, well, you see, double so glazing <laughs> and comfort. Oh, it's all the rage then. Mm. So, uh, the 1980s, the beginning of the 1980s, was then when the latest revival was, and that started in America. Oh. And they looked to our country and they said, look at all this stained glass you've got and you're throwing it away by the cartloads. You said you were getting bits like people were chucking it in skips. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, when I came with mum, I don't know if it was last year or year before, when oh, we came to do it, we made a little time, <laughs> like, I made a galaxy with a little swirl in it, and um, <laughs> a little universe with a galaxy in it. And um, you were saying then that you've got these two really beautiful, and I was like, I really yeah. would love one of them. <laughs> Um, but yes. you can't believe it. Sorry, Corey. No, but that's what they were doing, yeah. you see. It wasn't popular at all and it would have died out. And there was a time when my father was the only person in the north of England doing leaded lights and repairs. So, thank goodness he yeah. here. So, um, so Uncle Jack retired, then my father carried on. And uh, when I said I'd like a window, it was because we were building here. And we put in a new staircase and we need, needed to get some borrowed light. Mm. Uh, and it was coming from a bedroom. We thought we'd need a bit of privacy, but we want the light. And we thought, ah, stained glass. I know a man who does it. <laughs> is, that, is that the nuns that are there now? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. We need to see yeah. those. They're just gone upstairs. I, I'm just well. looking up there as well. I'll oh, take yeah. my notes. That 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 the nuns were the stunning. first it's one. It's a vine with grapes hanging down and it's yeah. just... That was uh, done to because the double glazing broke down, wasn't it? We got compensation. Just disguised it. Did and you we do disguised that, it. Did you yeah. Yeah. Mm. Let's just make myself a new window. <laughs> window. <laughs> it was cheaper than getting it repaired. <laughs> <laughs>